afternoon. Um, I was going to say welcome, but not really, because you guys are the locals, I think. Uh, who here is not from Paris? Okay, that's at least a couple. Okay, who here is not from France? Hey, that's more than I thought, <laughs> but not as many. Uh, <clears throat> okay, my name is uh, Magnus Hagender. Uh, I'm a Postgres core team member, uh, one of the committers uh, on the project, and I do a lot of work for Postgres Europe, in which regards I've seen several of you before. Uh, when I don't do uh, paid work, or sorry, when I don't do community work, uh, for paid work I work for a company called Red Pill Inpro, which is an open source consultancy business in the Scandinavian region. So uh, I'm down here from Stockholm in Sweden myself. Uh, let me actually uh, ask another follow-up question, which is, uh, there was a PG day here in April, I think, in Paris as well. How many of you were there and saw my talk then? Okay, I'm glad that wasn't that many of you, because it's basically the same talk. <laughs> so you guys, you know, your excuse to, you know, go play with your phones or, or something like that if you want. Uh, so for the rest of you, uh, I mean, we'll keep running this whole uh, question and answer thing, right? How many of you read Planet Postgres today? Okay, that's a few. Actually, I think there's a French Planet Postgres, isn't there? Yeah, okay. So how many of you read that box? Even fewer. Come on, I'm in France. <laughs> You're supposed to read the French sites. <clears throat> okay, for those of you that don't read the Planet Postgres site, I will highly recommend it. Uh, in particular, an interesting feature is we have a number of people uh, who blog about the new versions all the time. So basically, Planet Postgres is a blogging aggregator, right? People who write blog posts about, about Postgres, we syndicate those into one place. And what you'll typically find is, you know, within a couple of days or a week of a new feature being committed to Postgres, someone will have written a blog post about how it works and examples of how to use it and things like that. And that will usually go up on this Planet Postgres site. So it's an excellent resource to keep track of what's happening with the new versions. It's an excellent resource for many other things around the Postgres community as well. Uh, so again, I, I highly recommend it. And I'm guessing, I have no idea how good the French one is, given that I don't read French, but I'm sure it's just as good, right? And not just translated versions of the other documents, but actual uh, original content as well, uh, targeted a bit more at the French side. But we're here to talk about Postgres 9.5, since most of you haven't already read about it there. Has anyone actually used Postgres 9.5 yet? Okay, a couple of you. In production? <laughs> oh, come on. <clears throat> okay, maybe a little bit production. I did the same thing, uh, this talk in Dallas about a week ago, and there were several people who were using it in production already. Most of them were, you know, well-known culprits from the Postgres community, but there were a couple of, of other people as well. Uh, taking a, a short look back, the actual development on 9.5 started in 2014, uh, where we branched off Postgres 9.4, which made the master repository, uh, or master branch in the Postgres repository, be what's eventually going to become Postgres 9.5. If we look at the master right now in Postgres, it's actually 9.6. So we have already made this branch for 9.6, because we're now finalizing 9.5. Then we had five rounds of uh, what we call commit fests which is basically the, the Postgres term for how we do the iterative development, where the idea is we do one month of development, and then we do one month of review, and then one month of development, and one month of review. Now, in reality, that didn't entirely work out this time. We basically were spending continuous time in reviewing, uh, but the idea was still to do that. Uh, and the current state of this is in August 2015, uh, the second alpha version was released. So the current version of 9.5 is 9.5 alpha 2. Uh, it has been released. Please help us review it and please help us test it. Uh, in particular, help us test it with your applications. If you have test suites for your application, please run them against the 9.5 alpha, right? Because if it breaks, it's so much better to know that now than after it's been released, right? <clears throat> you might not want, I mean, depending on who you are, you might not want to deploy it in production yet. But consider deploying the 9.5 alphas or betas into your testing systems. Because again, if you can tell us earlier that something is broken, then hopefully we can fix it before things are released, which you know helps everyone. Now the current schedule also has the first beta version will be released in the first week of October, which is I 
What date is it? It's not next week, right? But it's the week after that. That's the current schedule. That's obviously not guaranteed at this point uh, because we're not there yet, but that's the plan. <clears throat> and the general idea is once you hit the beta version, we will do what we can to make an upgrade to the release version be just you know, apt get upgrade or yum update and basically replace the binaries. No need to do a dump preload, no need to do a PG upgrade, just a, a sort of silent upgrade. There is no guarantee of that. We, if we find a bug that requires making an incompatible change, then we will make it. But we will do our best to have done all that beforehand. So, please go ahead and test those things. Uh, <clears throat> I had some statistics. This is actually uh, almost a month old statistics on the changes. So you can see we have you know, 2,500 files modified. We got about 200,000 new lines of code. 200,000 deleted lines of code. Obviously, the deleted lines are all bugs, and the new lines are all perfect, right? Uh, which means that, this means that 9.5 actually has almost double the changes of 9.4. And we all know that measuring lines of code is the best way to measure software quality and developer productivity, right? So basically, this means that 9.5 will be twice as good as 9.4. <laughs> That's awesome, isn't it? <clears throat> so what's actually in these 200,000 lines of code? Uh, some of the new features, obviously. Uh, there's a limited amount of time. In fact, it's even more limited than I initially thought. Uh, so I've had to cut a few things. Uh, there are many things in there. Uh, I've decided to single out a couple of them. Uh, and trying to group them a little bit, it's always hard. I've tried to group them in sort of developer and SQL level features, DBA and administration, and then sort of performance side, because everybody loves performance, right? Uh, so if we do another round of show of hands, how many of you in here would consider yourself being developers? Uh, I'm not talking about building Postgres, but building applications on top of Postgres. Okay, uh, so more uh, DBA or sysadmin. What's the rest of you? <laughs> <laughs> Performance architect? <laughs> Hardware vendor? Sales? Sales? <laughs> Marketing? <laughs> Out of a job? I know a lot of Postgres companies are hiring, by the way, so if you're out of a job, you know, go talk to a Postgres company. I don't think I know of any Postgres company that's not hiring, actually. I think they all are. <clears throat> anyway, let's dig into some of these features uh, and what we're talking about here. So uh, we're going to start with the developer and SQL level features. Now we start with a very small feature that's one of those things that, at least for me personally, it's been annoying me for years that this didn't work, and now it does. Uh, which is we can now do multi-column sub-select updates. So when you do an update, you update a table, you want to set the column to the resulting value of a subselect. It's a fairly common thing that we'd like to do. Right? And up to and including 9.4, you could only update one column. If you wanted to update two columns, you had to run two subqueries. If you wanted to update 10 columns, you ran 10 subqueries. And sort of somewhere between that, it became really annoying. Uh, this is very simple. Uh, this syntax that should have worked before, but just didn't. I've tried it many times. It doesn't work. Uh, it's basically you say an update set, and you list multiple columns, equals, and then you have a subquery that returns more than one column. Obviously, the number of columns that you return from inside the subquery has to be the same as the number you're trying to set. But as long as you do that, it just works. Uh, I've been annoyed with that one many, many times. <laughs> Another feature that we have that I'm actually not highlighting because of the new things that are coming out in uh, 9.5, which is uh, that our gen generate series function now supports numerics. Now, who in here had heard of generate series prior to just now? Okay, uh, it's less than half. Uh, the rest of you will want to look at generate series. It's an extremely useful tool, and that's the main reason I'm putting it up here. The previous version, we already had generate series, right? It could do integers and it could do timestamps. The only real difference here is we can do bigger numbers and decimal numbers, but the point of generate series is you call a function and it will generate a virtual table with a series of numbers in it. In its simplest form, you say generate series 1, 10, for example, it'll just generate numbers of, from 1 to 10. If you do it time-wise, you can say, you know, give me every day from between these two dates, or give me every hour between these two dates give me every fourth hour between these two times and things like that. 
Uh, and the difference in 9.5 is you're now able to do, like the example here, we do a generate series 0, 1, 0 0.1. We're going to generate every number between 0 and 1 at an interval of 0 0.1. So again, the new feature is not that big, but if you didn't know of generate series before, look into it. It can actually help in a lot of scenarios. It saddens me every time, and this happens fairly often, that I run across installations where people have actually got a table with every number from 1 to 10,000 in it, for example. An actual table with an index on it. Like, you don't need to do that. You're much better off using generate series in a case like that. Uh, <clears throat> so, moving on to a little bit more advanced features, we have a new locking mode for select for update. It's also a fairly narrow feature, but really, really useful in that case. Uh, you may have known that we already had a locking mode called no wait. If you just do a select for update from a table. If somebody else has locked any of the rows by doing another select for update or by doing an update, uh, Postgres will block and wait for them to finish, right? Because they're locked. If you add a for update no wait, as we see in the first example here, that's a feature that already exists. Uh, if somebody else has locked the row, Postgres would give you an error. So instead of blocking, it would just say, nope, somebody else has locked this and then you can come back and try again later. Uh, the new feature that we have is you can, instead of saying no wait, you can now say skip locked. The difference now is as we scan the table, every row that somebody else has locked, we will just skip it and go on to the next row. So you won't get all the rows back. But you will not get a blocking. Query will return immediately, or well, as soon as it's finished scanning the rows, and you won't get an error. Now, a really good use case for this is your typical work queue tables. I'm sure you've all seen many applications where you have a table with a you know, number of things that should be done, and then you have a bunch of workers who sort of pick something from the table, maybe run a stage, update the status in the table, move on to the next one, and you have multiple of these workers. Now, this is the excellent tool for that. What you will then say is for every worker, we'll just go in and say, select star from A for update, skip locked, limit one, which says get me one row. And since you say select for update, it's going to lock that row. Then when the next worker comes along, it's going to skip this row because it's locked and go on to the next row. And as soon as you're done, you commit or you roll back. Now your row is unlocked. The next worker is going to pick that row up and maybe move on to the next stage. Without any blocking and without any errors that you keep retrying. So if you have this type of work queue tables, this is a really big thing. It's going to both simplify your application and probably give it much better performance. Uh, so definitely something worth looking into. Uh, now those are two fairly small things. Then we have three, so I'd say, really big things on the SQL level that are coming uh, in 9.5. <clears throat> the first one is what we call row level security, uh, or the ability to apply access policies on a row basis. In Postgres today, you can set permissions on most level, right? You can set it on the database, you can set it on the schema, you can set it on the table, and you can set it on the column. And this is basically a way of setting it on a row. Now, it doesn't work like a general permission. A general permission, if you don't have permissions on a table, for example, you try to read from it, what happens? Access denied. Now, what row level security does is instead it applies a policy to the row saying whether you're allowed to see the row. If you do a select star from a table where you don't have allowed to, uh, where you don't have permissions to see certain rows, you're just not going to see them. You're not going to get an error. So you will only see those rows that you have permissions to see. You will not get an error. If you do a where clause that matches a row that you don't have permissions to see, you just don't get anything back. So it's not exactly the same thing as an ACL, but it's somewhat similar. And it's important to know that ACLs still apply. So you still need permissions on the database and on the table and on the schema and on the column. And then you also need the row level permission in order to see your rows. And if you fail the permissions check on the other layers, you're still going to get an access denied error. But if you fail the row level security policy, the row just gets filtered off. As usual, super users and object owners bypass it. There's also a new attribute that you can set on a user. So you can say alter user uh, with, and you can say bypass RLS, which will say that this user just ignores every row level security policy. This can be, for example, a monitoring system that needs to read all the data, or uh, maybe a backup user that needs to dump all the data. Because it's really hard to do backups of policy data unless you bypass the permissions. 
Otherwise, every, because everybody gets their own view of the data. <clears throat> so how this actually works is probably easiest to show with an example again. First of all, the role level security is turned off by default on all objects. So you have to enable it if you want it. You do that by saying alter table something, enable role level security. Now it's enabled. Then what you can do is for each table you can create one or more policies. <clears throat> so in this case I've created a policy called companies manager on the table companies. Uh, it says for all, that means it's for all operations. Update, insert, delete, and select. To public <laughs> means it applies to any role that's a member of public, which is everyone. <clears throat> and then we say using, and we add an expression. here. And this is sort of any Postgres expression. So in this case we say, uh, any user trying to do anything with the companies table will only be able to access rows where the column manager has the same value as current user. So that means when I'm logged in as a different user, I will see different rows. Uh, first here I'm logged in as user Postgres, which is a super user, bypasses RLS. It gets my you know, three magic rows from its small testing table. Then I reconnect as the user test. We'll notice that test, only this row has test as manager. I run the exact same query, that's the only row I get back. Uh, these two rows that have MHA as manager, they don't come back because the RLS policy says that I'm not allowed to see them unless I am that user. Uh, it's basically, as you can see, it's a mandatory where clause. Right? It is as if we took this thing that we put here, manager equals current user, and put a where clause up here that says where manager equals current user, except the user can't change this where clause. It's always there. Uh, and basically what you can do is you can create these policies on any regular expression. And that's important to note, that's a regular expression, not a regexp. <laughs> so any Postgres expression, except an aggregate. But you can do subqueries to other tables in your row level security policy. That works perfectly fine. You can have multiple policies in every table. The results are then ORed together. So as long as there is one policy that gives the user access, the user will have access. You can't create negative policies that sort of remove anything. <clears throat> and it's also important to know that the RLS policies do not affect cascading RI. That means if you have a, you know, a foreign key on update delete, for example, or, or sorry, on delete update or, or whatever they're called, I can never remember exactly then those are not affected in the other table. They will still cascade onto the other table. But any regular select, update, insert, delete will be affected. Now, I even wrote just as a test, in order to prove that this didn't work, uh, it works by the way, my proof failed. <clears throat> it looked like it didn't work initially, but that was my fault. So basically here is an example of a policy that actually does a recursive join over my organization structure that says not only am I allowed to see uh, the rows that I am the manager for. I'm also allowed to see the rows that anybody who is the manager for when I am their manager, sort of recursively through the structure. And you can put any, uh, so you can see here, I'm, not only am I doing a recursive query, I'm doing it on a different table. And it works. <coughs> now you can build super complicated policies this way. Uh, and it will work. It will not necessarily be fast. Right? Because, again, assume that this is basically, this thing here is injected into every query that you run. So at one point, it will reach a point where it just gets slow. <clears throat> but it will still work. So RLS is an interesting concept. Uh, I'm sure there are still some details to iron out about exactly how to use it. There are some potential sort of information leak things. It doesn't mean enable this and let all your users get, you know, open your port 5432 to the public internet. There are many other bad things you can do with that. Uh, but it's an excellent way of keeping a lot of complexity out of your application. For example, multi-tenancy support can be implemented as an RLS policy instead of having to notice every single place where you have a query in your application and add a where clause. Put it on the policy and if you forget to add the where clause in the application, nothing happens. Uh, the next big feature on the SQL level is insert on con conflict. Uh, and this is actually incorrect, what I've written here, but I'll fix that in a second. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the Postgres way of doing upsert. And yes, we have our own syntax for it. 
because you know everybody should have their own syntax. No, not really. But the reason most people will refer to this as absurd. In MySQL, there is a command called absurd, I believe. This command does not behave the same way. In the SQL standard, there is a command called merge. This command does not behave the same way. That's why we decided not to use the same syntax that somebody else did. We would only use the same syntax if we actually behaved the same way. But we don't. <clears throat> For example, unlike merge, as defined in the SQL standard, as far as I know, and all implementation, merge is not concurrency safe. Right? It doesn't work if two people are doing the same thing at the same time. In Oracle, it's not even atomic, which scared me when I found that out. Uh, MySQL upsert will fall over badly, I'm told, if you have more than one index on the table. There are many different ways. So uh, we, of course, claim that the Postgres way is better in every possible way. <clears throat> the syntax for Postgres is not what's written in here. It's not insert on conflict, do update or ignore. It's actually insert on conflict, do update or nothing. It used to be ignore, but we changed that, and I forgot to change one of my slides. Now, in better news, I changed my other slide, which is the example. <clears throat> so here's an example of how we use this. Okay, we say insert into test, colons ID and T. We assume here that ID is our primary key. Uh, it has to be unique of some kind. There has to be a unique index on it for this to work. So insert into test, values 2, comma foobar. We say on conflict, do nothing. What this basically means, if we're trying to insert this, and there's already a, a row with the value 2 in ID, then we're just going to not do anything. This is basically what happens today, except you also get an error and your transaction gets rolled back. Whereas if you use this syntax, we'll just keep going. You're saying, okay, I'm fine. I got the value 2 in. I don't really care about what value goes into t, but the value is there now. Yeah, that's the simplest form. The sort of normal absurd form is when you do something like this, where we instead say, insert into test, again, id, comma, t, values 2, comma, foobar, and we say, on conflict id. So we say if the insert is conflict and on the column ID, do update set t equals excluded.t. So what this means, if, if there was no row with the value 2, then we're going to insert the value. If there's already a row with the value 2, instead we're going to update that row and set the value of field t to t from this virtual table called excluded, which matches the conflicting rows. So this one basically says, if there's already value for 2, overwrite the value of t with foobar for that row. And this is your basic absurd. And as long as your syntax is this simple, it's, it's sort of like how absurd works. But you can set it to a different value. You can say insert all the columns, but if it's already there, I only want to update two of them. And things like that. So you can combine it. And in fact, you can put fairly complicated, again, expressions in it if you want. Here's an, another example that's completely different. <clears throat> in this case, we have a counters that has a URL and a number. We say insert into counters URL num values a URL, a value 1, on conflict URL. So we're assuming there's a unique index on URL. Do update, and then we set num, which is the num of this row, to counters.num plus excluded.num. So basically, we're saying if the row is not there, insert somewhere and a 1. If the row is there, increase the value for that row. And of course, this doesn't have to be a 1. It could be a 7. In which case, we insert the value 7. If it's there, we increase it by the value 7. So you can do a lot more than just a basic absurd. Uh, you can do very complicated things. Not always a good idea to make things complicated, but you can. Right? And you can put pretty much any expression in there. Now, the final thing that I have on the SQL side is that we have added support for grouping sets. Uh, grouping sets is actually, uh, at the basics, we've added support for cube and rollup, which is what most people know about when we talk about grouping sets. Uh, but we also have the fully generic grouping sets uh, that aren't actually used very often. These are quite often referred to as super aggregates. I just like the name. Uh, <clears throat> basically, this allows us to do things like partial sums and roll-up sums as we go through a result set. Again, it's probably easiest to show this with an example. So here's an example of a roll-up group, where we say select department, comma, count star from emps, which I guess is our employees, group by roll-up department. If we had just said group by department, we all knew what would have happened. Right? We've got an IT with a count of three and sales with a count of two. When we added roll-up, we got this last row that has null and the value of 5. 
which is the total of those two. Now this is pretty easy as long as we do it at this level. I mean, you could probably count that in your application pretty easily, right? In fact, you probably are doing that today. But we can, of course, also do this at multiple levels. The next level, in this case, we're apparently got a different table. We're saying select department, comma, name, comma, count star, comma, sum payout. So we've got two aggregates and two columns from this payout table or view and say group by roll up on both of those columns. In this case, we first get for every combination of department and name, we get a count and a sum. Then we get it, comma, null, and the count, which is all of those, and the sum, which is the sum of those. So we get a per department sum. And then for sales, we, again, we get the sum of those and the sum of those. And finally, we get the null and null, which is the total sum of everything. So you can get that at all levels. Now, the difference between cube and rollup is if you do cube, you would also get the sum going the other way around. So the sum for each name independent of department, which in a query like this doesn't really make any sense. Uh, but it's possible to get that. Uh, and the generic grouping sets functionality lets you just sort of mission match all the different orders of them. This is a great way of not having to do all those calculations in the application. And it also lets you pre-process this and then sort of take this result and join it with something else, for example. <coughs> uh, these nulls can also be found out. There is a new function called grouping, which will tell you whether this is a null that came from the grouping set, or if it's a null that was actually in the table, if you have a table that might contain nulls. Um, so moving on to some of the more DBA level features. Uh, who in here is currently using foreign tables for something? Okay, that's not a lot of you. Okay, well, like the three of you are going to be really happy that you can now do import foreign schema. <clears throat> Prior to this, if you had 100 tables in a different database and you wanted to use them, it was fine. You just had to run create foreign table 100 times with the right syntax. Now you can instead say import foreign schema from another server and it'll get all the tables that you have access to on that server and put them on this server as foreign tables. Now this is still a one-time operation. It will copy the table definitions over. So if you then go to the other server and do an alter table, you have to synchronize that manually. This is a one-time thing where we generate all the definitions. Uh, but it does really help. Uh, another one of those features that I'm sure the name of it is really going to help you, foreign tables can now participate in inheritance trees. That made you all really happy, right? You're like, um, okay, what does that mean? Well, inheritance trees or inheritance in Postgres is what we currently build partitioning on. So Postgres partition table is built on inheritance trees. And what it basically means is you can now take one partition in your partition table and put it on a different server. In fact, you can take one partition and put it in Oracle, and one partition in Mongo, and one partition in MySQL, and run queries against it, and it will work as if it was local. Well, it'll be slower than if it was local, obviously. But as a general rule, it will work using the same kind of partitioning thing. So you can use this for sharding and things like that. <clears throat> now, it's still not very well optimized, so more work needed there. Uh, but it's a good foundation, and it's actually useful today. Just not you know, as useful for, or as optimized as we'd like to see. Fairly small thing, but again, if you're using it, very useful. You can now change a table between being logged and unlogged uh, by alter table set unlogged and alter table set logged. Word of warning, when you do alter table set logged, if you are using anything other than while level equals minimal, so if you're using any sort of replication or so, it will copy your entire table into the transaction log when you do that because it now needs to replicate. Okay, if your table is big, that takes a long time. Doing alter table set unload this fast, because we're just you know, losing data there intentionally. Right? But alter table set log can take a long time, unless you're in while level minimum. Uh, speaking of the while, we've broken your configuration. Heike has broken your configuration. <coughs> the checkpoint segments command is no longer there. Uh, sorry, the checkpoint segments parameter is no longer there. Instead, we have uh, two separate parameters, min while size and max while size. They are now defined in megabytes and gigabytes instead of weird segments of 16 megabytes. And the maximum actually means maximum. The default values have also been changed rather drastically. Uh, the previous value was the default was three, which was 48 megabytes. 
Uh, now the minimum size is set to 80 and the maximum while size is set to 1 gigabyte. So the maximum while uh, has been increased drastically. Now you hopefully can afford 1 gigabyte, but if not, you will need to with, uh, reduce this parameter again. <clears throat> the thing is you also set the minimum and the maximum and checkpoints are automatically tuned to happen somewhere in between these using some heuristics, a moving average of the results of previous checkpoints and things like that. Uh, if you want the previous behavior there, you can set, you can still set minimum and maximum to the same value. Right? Then you get the previous behavior. Um, but the important thing is also you can set the, if you set the max to one gigabyte, it is one gigabyte. It's not like with the old parameters where we set something, you also need to reserve space for two to three times what you actually told us. It, this is actually the maximum. Yeah, so that should be enough. Uh, another thing that will break your configurations, it's small, but it's important. In your recovery.conf, uh, pause that recovery target doesn't exist anymore. Instead, we have a recovery target action that can take three different values, pause, promote, and shutdown. If you set it to pause, that equals what previously was pause at recovery target equals true, which means that once your recovery has reached the defined target, it opens up the system in read-only mode as a replication slave. Promote is the previous default, uh, <clears throat> which is just open up the system and start working on it when you're done. And shutdown is a new mode which says once you've reached um, your recovery target, we shut the system down instead. This can be useful when people are doing things like preparing a replica from a point in time recovery and things like that. You really don't want it to open up because in that case it can no longer rejoin the cluster. Uh, Small things on the statistics side in the DBA, there is now a PG stat SSL that will tell you information about existing SSL connections. Same information as in contrib SSL info, uh, <clears throat> except you can see for everyone. So as a DBA, you can go in and see which of my connections are actually using SSL. Did I configure it correctly? What encryption level are they using? Are they using certificates? Is compression enabled? Uh, all those things are visible. PG stat statements has been further enhanced. It now tracks maximum, minimum, minimum, mean, and standard deviation for execution times. Uh, very useful. Anyone not using PG stat statements today, go look at PG stat statements. It's a really good way to figure out what your system is actually doing. Uh, it is definitely, in my opinion, worth installing it in pretty much every installation that you have. Adds a little bit of overhead, totally worth it. So speaking of overhead, let's take a look at a few of the things around performance. One of the biggest things we got on the performance side is what is known as BRIN indexes or block range index indexes. Um, this was previously known as minmax. If some of you have heard presentations about the idea of minmax indexes, uh, this is the same thing except it's generalized so it now supports other op classes. The idea behind BRIN is to create really, really small and efficient indexes. Your typical index, a B tree index, for example, or a gist index or something, will, for every row in your table, you will have a row in the index. Right? So you have an integer column, you'll have that integer in the index in a three, four month so that you can find it fast. <clears throat> now, brain indexes are different. Instead of storing a value for every row, you take the entire table and you split it into what we call block ranges. That's the name. By default, we take 128 blocks of eight kilobytes each. So that's a fairly large set, and then we look at that, and for that set of blocks, we, in the index, we only store the minimum and the maximum value for this block. So for 128 times 8 kilobyte, we store two values. <coughs> that means the index is really, really small. Even if your table is multiple terabytes, your index is small. Uh, <coughs> the index fits in memory, the index is really cheap to maintain. Of course, it's not as efficient as a B-tree index because if you select for a value, all we're going to know is the value exists somewhere in these 128 blocks. And then we're going to have to go scan those 128 blocks to find the actual value. But in a lot of cases, just the overhead of maintaining and keeping the index is so big that you can't actually afford to have an index. And by using something like a BRIN index, that problem goes away because it's tiny and it's cheap to maintain. It is best suited for what we call naturally ordered tables. Because the whole point, if every block is going to contain like a huge set of values, then it doesn't really help you. But if in a typical, say a log table, every row gets like a timestamp and it's increasing and increasing, then the brain index is going to be really efficient. 
Because you go look for a certain value and it's going to say, well, that one only existed in you know, these 200 blocks way back there. And we can go scan just those blocks. So for anything that's naturally ordered, Brin indexes are really efficient. It can be timestamps. It can be if you just have a pri increasing primary key, something like that. It's very, very good for those. Creating a Brin index is just like any other index, right? Create index a Brin on, and you say using Brin, and you're done. And what you will see is that every query using this index will use a bitmap index scan and then a bitmap heap scan. <clears throat> That's how we know we find the index, and then we have to go look at all these pages. That's how that looks in a uh, Postgres query plan. And if you want to change, you can change this pages per range. The default, again, is the 128 blocks per time we index. You can change that to 1024. Now we do 8 megabytes for every two values. And the definition of this maximum and minimum value is going to depend on the data type. The ones we ship in Postgres by default are all min and max. But plugins could create others. PostGIS could figure out some neat way of defining, I don't know, bounding boxes or something to use a brand saying everything within this box is on these areas. Uh, there's a lot of plugability. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of more happening around it, but the important things that are there now are basically things like integers and timestamps, which is going to fit into the use case for a lot of these tables. Uh, there's been a lot of things done around sorting. One of the things I like about this is you don't have to do anything. Okay, sort it, uh, using text and numeric, I'm going to use abbreviated keys. Uh, we do pre-checks for equality because comparing bytes is a lot cheaper than comparing strings and a bunch of other things. But basically it means that everything you do that includes sorting, whether it's a sort or you know a create index or a join that happens to do a sort, it's all just going to run faster. And you don't need to do anything. The best kind of performing. I mean, for brain indexes, you have to actually create the index. This will just work. Uh, likewise, there's been a lot of things done on the internal APIs for locking. We have an internal, internal atomic operations API that uh, relies obviously on CPU instructions to do this. The lightweight locks have been rewritten for better scalability using this. Uh, these two together will give Postgres a much better chance running at high CPU counts and high concurrency levels. That'll just run the, more of the same thing faster. There are many more lockless operations. You can, for example, uh, enable, disable foreign keys uh, and triggers on a table without locking it. Today, to do an alter table to turn off a trigger, you still have to somewhere get in and get a lock on the table. It, you don't have to hold it for very long, but you have to get the lock. And if you have a highly concurrent system, when are you going to do that? Right? There's always someone there, and you're going to end up locking things. <clears throat> There's more to go, but over the past couple of releases, we've seen more lockless operations go into every one of them, I think. Uh, it's not done yet. We're getting closer uh, to making more of these operations safe to run without affecting your application, without affecting the actual runtime in your database, because you know you probably have a 24-7 application. So there's always a lot more. I don't have time to go through them all, but you know, please download again, download and test. Uh, make sure the things work. Uh, there are many, many smaller fixes. There are many more performance enhancements. There are new features. If any of you, I know there's a couple of people in here who have patches in this version of Postgres. If I didn't mention your patch, I'm sorry. <coughs> Especially if it was one of the ones that I deleted just before this talk when I realized I only had 30 minutes. <laughs> but again, they're all there. They're all important. Look at Planet Postgres, for example, to read more about them or just read the release notes. Uh, please go ahead and test things. Uh, I've got one final show of hands things that I want to run, which is uh, which of these features, the ones that I mentioned, oops, do you think is the most important one? Which one makes you the most excited about 9.5? So who thinks it's absurd? Or, well, insert on conflict ignored. Okay, grouping sets. Okay, or less, role level security. That's unusually few. <laughs> Foreign table inheritance. Okay, brain indexes. Oh, that's a lot. A lot of data warehousing people here, I see. <clears throat> Anything else? Anyone want to throw something else out as being the most important thing in 9.5? So we have everything. Yes. Sorry, Jason. Something about Jason. Oh, you can, so you can delete the key from inside a JSON object. Okay. Yes. Uh, so yep, that's another feature that's not big enough to make it to my slides. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I think we're moving directly into another talk, or do we move into a break? Directly to another talk? Okay. But I will be around, I think, for the rest of the afternoon, so if you have any questions, just grab me up.